Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney broadcasting from the Valley of the Sun deep in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. And today we're talking about the testimony from Proud Boys in trial day 54. We've been covering this trial for some time now, and it is still going on. We're wondering if we're getting close to the close we have a little bit of business to attend to before we get into the meat and potatoes of the trial uh, activities. I want to start by going through Zachary Reel's defense motion. There was an interesting filing from Carmen Hernandez, who really got into it with the judge today. I mean, there's really some heated exchanges that we're about to get into when we get to the trial. But before they showed up, there were filings. We went through a bunch of them yesterday, identifying 50 plus feds from Roger Roots. But there was another one alleging that this fella, Paul Russell Johnson, was really the seditious conspirator, that they were this individual and others were responsible for the crimes. And so it's this motion where one defendant is pointing the fingers at the other defendants or other co-defendants or anybody else to say, I'm not guilty. Carmen Hernandez filed that. And I think she makes a pretty good argument. You know, if everybody on January 6th was an insurrectionist. If everybody was stealing the Capitol, how do you differentiate who was worse or was everybody just guilty or how does this work? Right? Don't you typically differentiate between the severity of the crimes in a just society you would? We're trying to gauge that here. So we'll go through that. There's a follow-up motion. There, actually, this was an order that came out from Judge Kelly denying the window guy. We had a suspicion this was coming. But this was the official order, and I wanted to read it because it was kind of surprising. He was very upset with the defense for disclosing this witness so late, he said. And we're sitting here scratching our heads going, what are you talking about? Every day we come through this trial, there's new disclosure from the government. In this these cases, it's generally about confidential human sources, a.k.a. feds, in the January 6 activities. And so this is where we're going to go through today. We've also got the full day's trial activities brought to us courtesy of Brandy Buckman, as usual, at Brandy Buckman on Twitter. We'll go through all of that and more. But my friends, before we get into any of it, we got to make sure we're properly energized, that we're filled with our delicious fruits and vegetables, courtesy of our friends at fieldofgreens.com, because we would all like to lose some of those leftover pandemic pounds, you know, but how sick are you? Of all these ads for the weight loss pills, the fad diets, you know, all that stuff. We've all been there. We've all done that. And we know they don't work, but you know what does? Eating five healthy servings of fruits and vegetables every day. You do that, the weight would probably just fall right off. But look, vegetables and fruit, not a fan. Who's got time to prepare that every day? I don't, but I do have time for Field of Greens. Now, Field of Greens is a science-backed formula, very specific fruits and vegetables that you won't find in any other product. We know that proper nutrition reboots your metabolism so you can burn calories faster and lose weight a healthier way. And Field of Greens is the only brand backed by a better health promise. Yes, you're going to look healthier and feel healthier fast, but the better proof is going to come at your next doctor's visit when he says, wow, you look fabulous. Whatever you're doing, keep it up. And so let's get you started. Go on over to fieldofgreens.com. Don't forget to use code Robert when you check out. They've got all sorts of other things there if you want some other products to help you with any other facet of your life. Tons of goodies. Fieldofgreens.com. And don't forget to use code Robert so that you can save 15% at checkout. And remember, the vegetables want to be eaten. That's why they're here. They're disappointed if they just sit in your cabinet or sit in the ground. So make sure you eat them. Go to fieldofgreens.com. Don't forget to use code Robert. All right, so let's get right into it, my friends. Without any further ado, Zachary Real files a motion alleging that somebody else was responsible for all of these so-called insurrectionary criminality. And this is an interesting filing from his lawyer, Carmen Hernandez. Zachary Real, of course, was the individual who is a part of the Proud Boys. He is on the stand currently in day 54 of the trial. And so Carmen Hernandez filed this simultaneously with the close of this case. We're getting near the end point of this case where evidence is going to come to a close and the case will be handed off to the jurors. And before we get into her motion that is pointing the finger at somebody else, in this case, it's Paul Russell Johnson. I want to take a quick look at this individual's charges because Paul Russell Johnson 
was also somebody that you could find charged and published all over the place on the Capitol breach cases. And so they have him here as somebody who was inflicting bodily injury on certain officers, a lot of the same other charges. But what you'll notice is there's no seditious conspiracy charge here. Okay, obstruction, law enforcement, obstruction, justice, Congress, engaging in physical violence in the Capitol grounds. Now, he's still got his case open. He's on personal recognizance. Okay, so he's out of custody. Defendant remains on personal recognizance bond. He's out of custody, according to the DOJ. He's not in custody. He's not like the Proud Boys. So he's out. Now, he's got charged with inflicting bodily injury on officers. Hmm. But you don't see seditious conspiracy in that charge, do you? So let's go back through this. And we'll go through Ms. Hernandez's motion. She writes the following. On behalf of Zachary Real, Ms. Hernandez writes, this is our notice of filing that we have authority to introduce evidence about third party guilt. In this case, it would be Paul Russell Johnson, the individual we just referenced. She says that as this trial was ongoing, the court said that we cannot allow evidence to come in. And that obviously was not fair, according to Mr. Real. So Mr. Real submits the following in support of the admission of a videotaped statement by Paul Russell Johnson. In other words, Carmen is saying, we want to show this video recording of that guy to show that our guy's innocent. And because the judge excluded this evidence from the trial, that is unfair, denying him the right to a fair trial guaranteed under the Constitution. Now, if the court engages in arbitrary rules of evidence and just keeps things out, that may be a basis for recourse. And she says that with respect to this video, Judge Merriweather, in another case, issued an arrest warrant based on the complaint filed in this case. The criminal complaint, which we're going to take a look at, was based on facts contained in an affidavit. Among other facts, the affidavit includes a link to the self-inculpatory statement, which means it is incriminating him. And the video says the following, which of course we'll take a look at. So zooming out, Carmen Hernandez is saying, Your Honor, we're in the middle of this trial. We're on day 54 now. I wanted to introduce evidence of this Johnson fellow's videotape statement. In the statement, he says something pretty bad. And she's saying that he's already been prosecuted by the DOJ in this case. And the law, according to the defense, says we can actually introduce this evidence that shows the existence of third party perpetrators. In other words, other people are responsible for this crime, not the Proud Boys. And also remember that this is Carmen Hernandez only ref only defending Zachary Real. She's not defending the other Proud Boys. She's in this entire trial. The theme has been Zachary Real was very far removed from the others. Which one of these things is not like the others? Which one of these things just doesn't belong here? She's saying it's Zachary Real. And so as we continue on, the criminal complaint that they're referencing is somebody else who did a lot of the conduct that they're trying to pin on Zach. And she says that there is, when there is an existence of a third party perpetrator, we can talk about it as long as it's not too speculative or remote. Long as it's not too far removed. Okay, somebody else on the other side of the Capitol building may not be relevant, all right, not there. But what about this Johnson individual? And as we saw, the US government is already prosecuting him. And if we take a look at the actual statement of facts that came out from the FBI agent, we ask ourselves where this person was. And we've gone through many of these here on this channel. And we've taken a look at all the different angles and diagrams and representations. We've got the peace monument here come up a lot in the trial. And as we fast forward, this special agent from the FBI is identifying Johnson. You see, Johnson has an arrow pointed to his bullhorn right here. The yellow arrow, it says Johnson's megaphone. As he approaches the Capitol Police, and you remember this scene, we've seen this scene many times right near the original breaches. Guess what happens as we continue on in the timeline? More people appear at the fence, area closed. We're trying to identify Johnson. Now, this FBI agent has done a good job of this. And you remember this person here with the red hat. That hat's going to be backwards in a minute. 
So Johnson is here, they're saying, confronting uniformed Capitol Police officers. And as this fast forwards, there's his bullhorn. The indictment, this is the criminal complaint. It continues. They have him here. He's right up front. You remember the red hat, Ryan Samsel. And as we continue on, this FBI agent, who's very good at playing Where's Waldo, they spent years putting this stuff together. They were adding on the yellow pointy arrow to identify Johnson pushing and pulling on barricades. Now, Zachary Real, the person who's drafting this motion, is never uh, allegedly involved in any of this stuff, according to the defense. He didn't knock anything over. He wasn't being violent. He just kind of waltzed in there, and he just happened to be in some chat groups with the Proud Boys. And, you know, a lot of these other people got charged with crimes. For example, this person here got charged with crime. Johnson, we just saw he got charged. We know that this guy got charged, Samsel. But did this guy get charged? This one right here? Do you know who that is? Oh, that's weird. He just makes weird appearances in the middle of criminal complaints. Strange. <laughs> weird. Uh, no, he didn't get charged. That's Ray Epps obviously. And he's right there, <laughs> right as everybody else is breaching it. No charges for him, though. Johnson is lifting and pushing the barricades. Now there he is. Okay, so we're asking ourselves, were the Proud Boys really responsible for this? Did they really insurrect the Capitol building? Because Ray Epps was standing right there. These other two guys have already been charged with crimes. Officers on the ground. And there goes Johnson rushing in. So golly, it might be useful then to post some of his statements about what he was involved in in this trial to exonerate the Proud Boys. No? Because... If everybody did the thing, then did anybody do the thing? If everybody's responsible for the insurrection, then is any, did anybody really insurrect anything? I mean, really. We have to apportion the sedition to, uh, to a number of people. And if the Proud Boys were the ones who were supposedly, according to this deluded prosecution, if they were the ones who were instigating and initiating the whole thing, well, then... Why can't we use this evidence to show an alternative theory? And of course, that is what Ms. Hernandez is doing. She says that what they want in and what this judge excluded was this, this statement that Mr. Johnson made. This is what he said. And the judge in this case, the Proud Boys case, said, no, this is not allowed. This is not admissible. They wrote, your affiant reviewed this video and has determined that Johnson made the following statements while speaking to another individual outside the hotel. This is what Johnson said. And remember, we're asking ourselves, did these Proud Boys really have a conspiracy to engage in sedition and take this country over? Let's see. Here's what somebody else, Johnson, who we just saw was at the front part of the breach, literally breaking the breach. He's out, of, out on personal recognizance, according to the DOJ, says, yeah, we're like going to the Capitol. We're going to the effing Capitol is what he says. So we get to the Capitol and when we get to the street, you know where that uh, the statute is, you know, at the street, where the circle roundabout is. He says, way the F uh, away from the Capitol. He said they had gates at that end. All right. And he said, me and this other guy, Collins, he's in here with us. And I didn't know what he was. I mean, we didn't know e each other for anything. He says, I looked, I'm sitting at the gate. I've got my hands on him and there's cops all over the place. He says, you know, there's like five cops standing up the way a little bit. Beyond them is a lot of cops. So me and him, we look at each other, him and this other guy, Collins, and we already knew what time it was. He's like, we knew what time it was. It's go time. We started pulling the gates apart and we started bum rushing. Cops started hightailing to the effing Capitol, right? Wow. And we get to the gate and then there's three sets of gates. And before you get to the stairs of the Capitol, all right, we get to the next gate. He says, God, there's probably, I don't know, there's a there's an S load of cops up there. Then he says, second wing, we're breached, pulled up. We start throwing stuff. I mean, we're at, we're fighting cops and stuff. I have video where I'm slinging one around, all right? This guy, 
slinging a cop around. Zachary Reel's in custody. His defense says he's not engaged in anything violent at all. We're going to see if there's any convictions for anything violent at all. And he's got a one and a one year old daughter hasn't seen this guy slinging cops all over the place. Hmm, interesting. But the Proud Boys have been made to be the people who have stolen the whole country. All right. So we get to the third gate, says Johnson, and they're all hightailing to the top of the Capitol. We get up to the steps. It's bolted down to the ground. The gate was. It was a black gate. So we grab it. We start doing this number here. The next thing you know, it's bear mace, the whole front row, dude. And so Carmen says, all right, well, throughout the entire YouTube video, a woman wearing a black Harley Davidson hooded sweatshirt can be seen standing near Johnson and can be heard interjecting as Johnson describes how he, how he personally broke through metal barricades set up outside the Capitol building. The black Harley Davidson sweatshirt, which the woman is wearing, appears to be the same sweatshirt Johnson is seen in different figures up above. Right. So Carmen is pointing fingers at somebody else saying, my client's innocent. And if you're going to be putting and trying to pin this conduct on our clients, we should be able to point our fingers at other people, which is what happens in any criminal case ever. That's why you get co-defendants and people start pointing each other, pointing their finger. I didn't do it. No, it's not my drugs. What are you nuts? Not my drugs. Pfft, never seen that before in my life. Never seen that before. Yeah, but it was in your glove box. I, I, I didn't drive this thing. And around and around we go. So perfectly reasonable, but you got to remember the DOJ and the judges, they do not want to allow this type of stuff to happen. They don't want other defendants to be able to point fingers at each other because if they did, then everybody would be using this argument and, and maybe many more cases would be dismissed or bound up in the courts. So the judges and the prosecutors have been requesting and narrowly tailoring these arguments. But we'll see what the prosecutors say in response. I would guess it's very unlikely that this gets granted and that this information would be admissible. But if there were a bunch of other individuals who were actually responsible for doing the things that they're blaming the Proud Boys were, shouldn't you be allowed to talk about that? If you're being blamed for breaking the lamp at a hotel bar, but there's evidence somebody else did it, shouldn't you be able to introduce that? Government is saying no. We'll see what the judge says, of course. So that was the statement of facts on real. Now, we also have Pozzola. There was a conversation we had yesterday about this window guy and we, you know, we, we love our window guys here and we were excited to see him come in and testify. This was an interesting thing. The window guy is not going to be testifying because judge Kelly said he's not properly been disclosed. Minute order came out. We were very excited to hear from the window guy, Duffy Hoffman. Why? Because they're blaming all the so-called insurrectionists for all the damage. And you can't do that. You've got to apportion the damage. It's got to be provable. You've got to have some sort of basis for making a criminal charge stick if the allegation is that there was a certain amount of damage. And many counts require a certain threshold of damage. In this case, for example, if it's $1,000 or more, it may be aggravated or not, right? We have distinctions between the different classifications of damages. So the judge came out and he said, well, you know, That to call this notice untimely would be an understatement, okay? So he's very upset that the defense disclosed him late, apparently. And he wanted him to come in and testify, saying that under no normal conventional recognized industry standard could the window damage, the glass damage, be as valued as high as $1,000 or more. But that, that's not the basis for why they are excluding him. They're really excluding him because it was just late. They disclosed it late. Pozzola's notice for Hoffman is facially deficient under the rules. And it's all, look at this ruling. And it's also late. But the bottom line is the government never received notice for Hoffman. And therefore, the defendant's case in chief is at the end. Time has simply run out for Pozzola to remedy the deficiency and to provide adequate notice to avoid prejudicing the government. Therefore, it's ordered that his testimony is excluded, which is just amazing because as we've been following along on this trial, 
we have seen a consistent dripping a disclosure of new confidential human sources informants from the government the go in other words the government is free to continuously drip out information but if the defense has a late disclosure the judge draws the line on that one sorry can't allow that too late and the defense has made many arguments we read through them yesterday where the defense was saying we would have changed our entire case had we known that there were 50 plus chs's roaming around january 6. but the judge well sorry you know it's a trial's almost over next topic and so not many good rulings coming out for the proud boys let's turn our attention to day 53 54 and see what we have in store in the trial as usual we check in day 54 of the proud boys seditious conspiracy trial here they're in D.C. Zachary Real is going to be resuming testimony. As usual, we're following Brandy Buckman, who is there doing an amazing job live tweeting away. And as the day gets going, the defendants appear in court. And away we go. Judge Kelly takes the bench. All rise. Oh, gosh, all right, geez. It's finally about time to get started. All right, please be seated. He says, all right, now. There were two issues that I want to get resolved before we get going, and they were teed up for me overnight. He says, let me address one thing that I can just address quicker first. This is about Mr. Pozzola and about his potential cross-examination. Remember that Dominic Pozzola is one of the Proud Boys. In fact, it is this Proud Boy. He may be testifying, and the question is, if he testifies, what is the cross-examination going to look like? What will the scope of that cross-examination be? entail what will be allowed. He says, well, I want you to know, I'm going to address one thing. Your lawyers, why don't you do this? I want you to file one document. And having looked at it, I really don't see if the government is going to do, and he says, and Roots, you mentioned a statement that Pozzola reportedly said to Nordine. They're taking a, a key statement and asking if the government can ask questions about that key statement. The judge says the government didn't respond to that or elicit that. And it strikes me that that it would be subject to a different analysis because unlike other things, the video evidence doesn't really support any of the other things. And the government is saying that they're going out of their way to say these things were untrue and just something that they're going to suggest Pozzola is not telling the truth. So the judge is laying a foundation. He says, so assuming we're just talking about the things the government has laid out in its email about Biggs and the interaction with Samsel and what he said, and the government will make clear that they don't think there's any evidence of that beyond what Mr. Pozzola has said. The judge says, it seems to me that they get to do with all the details of what Mr. Pozzola elicited. And obviously, I do think, Mr. Pattis, that you'll have a right on cross-examination to get into it. He says, I don't see how I can sanitize it, Mr. Metcalf, in the ways that you proposed in your email that apparently we haven't seen. And in terms of taking talking about a material or fact or something like that, the details and the elaborateness of what Mr. Pozzola said, it'll be hard to communicate the nature of what he said and how it was untrue. Judges talking and talking. And the defense says, uh, okay, Your Honor, so it's, this is going to be similar to how Your Honor puts limitations on various other different components of the trial. Okay, so when you narrow down any witness with reference to their criminal history, you very easily could say that the questions presented to that individual haven't been arrested and so forth. And what I'm proposing around those is around similar lines. Similar lines, right? He's saying, you've done stuff like this before. You've said that we can't ask about criminal history with other witnesses. So why don't you do something similar here? And apparently Metcalf is getting loud, right? Loud. He's talking loudly. The government, he says, the government is seeking to elicit that he lied and lied about a material fact. And so if he gets up there, this would eliminate the prejudice to allow us to get into the details. It opens the door up to the who, what, when, and where. And Judge Kelly, he says, hey, 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 hey. Mr. Metcalf, don't you, there's no need to shout here in this courtroom. He says, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm sorry for shouting. He says, you know, it just calls into question what was the surrounding circumstances, what was going on with his attorney 
you know, what advice he was being given and the pressure to put on him and all these things. He says it calls into question him even being in jail, you know, not getting medication at certain points and suffering from withdrawals. And I'm going to have to dive into all of that when I ask him questions. This is his lawyer talking about his direct exam. He says, I ask you, Judge, to consider these things in their totality and in addition to the substantial prejudice if you let that stuff in. So it sounds like when we pause for a moment, it sounds like there were emails, there were exchanges, they're talking about certain bits of evidence and whether or not when Dominic Pozzola testifies, he is a defendant, we're currently going to pick up with Zachary Real in the trial, but he'll be done. And then Dominic Pozzola may be the next one up. And so they're arguing about evidence and they want to talk about some of the evidence, but they don't want the government to ask and cross-examine about other portions of the evidence. And we don't really know what they're exactly they're talking about because we're not there. Judge says, well, it seems to me if he wants to explain why something he said is false, he has a right to do that. In other words, the statement can come in and then he can explain it. So we, we let him see it and then he can explain it away. And so Norm Pattis for Joe Biggs, who is not Dominic Pozzola, and says, well, I don't want, he says, your honor, I don't want evidence brought in about a gun and Joe Biggs. Now, I don't know where this gun came from all of a sudden, but Norm Pattis says, I don't want evidence about a gun coming in. If evidence of a gun comes in, he says, it's going to be associated with my client, Joe Biggs. And then I can't undo that. He says, even the government doesn't believe that Samsel saw it. I guess meaning the gun. Defense attorney Pattis also adopts Metcalf's prejudice argument and says also if the gun comes in, then it's going to be too much that for me to undo and it's going to be too harmful for our case. Remember, 403 is more hurtful than it is helpful, more harmful than it's useful. If it's very useful and it's harmful, but it's more useful than harmful, we'll let it in. If it's very useful, but it's a little bit more harmful than useful, we throw it out. So this conversation about a gun is, you can imagine, very harmful, right? Obviously, anytime a gun is involved in any case, it's extremely harmful. So it better be very related to the case. You can't just say the word gun anywhere. Now, they're arguing about this. They say, we have a lot of video, and Judge Kelly says none of that video shows Biggs with a gun. None of that shows him with the gun. And there's no evidence of this, including video evidence. And so I understand why you're making the argument, but I'm just saying as I'm weighing the 403 nature, if we did not have any video of day and jury wouldn't see from 20 different angles, then we, we would be able to conclude, look, no evidence he had a gun. I might feel differently. Because I take your point about the gun specifically and I'll see if it changes my mind. So talking about a gun, and again, we don't know exactly what the argument is. Let's see what the prosecutor says. He says, your honor, this feels a little bit weird. Having the court instruct that there is no evidence of something seems a little bit off to me. Hmm. So it sounds like the defense wants some sort of instruction. They want the judge to say, hey, ladies and gentlemen, there's no gun here. All right. Maybe a gun popped up in something we didn't see. And they're trying to correct it. The defense is like, oh, gosh, there was, there was some, some talk of a gun. Correct it. And the prosecutor says, well, there's no evidence of something, so you don't even have to mention the gun. The judge says, well, in addition to the government eliciting this through questioning, think about what that would say, because that strikes me as having a lot of value here. Whether there's no evidence of or the government doesn't contend, whatever you like, but it makes a ton of sense. He says, obviously, it's not the government's position that Biggs did not have a gun. And if I'm going to allow this, we should be trying as hard as we can to make clear to the jury there is no evidence of that or that's not the government's position. All right. So in other words, if they're going to be talking about a gun in any way, they're going to be very clear about it. This is the government's position. It's not their gun and so on. The judge says, has the door been opened at all to the notion that Mr. Real used images of violence from prior rallies to encourage people to join the Proud Boys based on testimony that's already been given? So he's asking a question to everybody. Has Real opened the door? 
Can we ask questions about using images of violence to encourage people to sign up? If so, maybe we can talk about other images. And the judge says, you know, I looked at the transcript last night and I saw that the prosecutor laid out something. But I don't see how that door is not opened. Now, that doesn't suggest that all this video material are in. But I don't see how that isn't impeaching of him. And to some degree that he's extending certain and sending certain materials out there. Okay, so the judge is saying, all right, maybe he did open the door. You can impeach him. If he's saying I didn't use violence to encourage people to sign up, you can show that he did. Brandy continues. She's reporting that you might be able to say explicitly that people wanted to join the Proud Boys become of this. And yesterday there was a reference to this testimony. He said, "How? why were people signing up? Well, it was one of the reasons. What Was that a direct result of what happened on December 12th? Was what? Was people signing up because of what happened on the 12th? He says it was one of the reasons. What, what was one of those reasons? Maybe the violence. Oh, that means you can talk about violence in other rallies now. The door has been open. Now, after the election, we got a high influx of new guys. And that's after Donald Trump mentioned the Proud Boys at the, at the debate. So that video, the government is trying to introduce. So Carmen Hernandez jumps in. He says, I'm reading from the transcript. The judge is reading from this transcript in open court, reading it, reading it, talking. And remember, I think Carmen Hernandez was asking Zachary Real about this. Asked him a question. So you guys got a bunch of new members. Is that true, Zach? Yeah. And was that because of what happened on the 12th? Objection, overruled, was one of the reasons. And so he says, can you explain this to me, Carmen? And she says, yeah, your honor, that video the government is trying to introduce did not mention the Proud Boys or recruiting from the Proud Boys at all. And the judge says, okay, Carmen, okay, just stay with me for a minute. All right, before we get to the factual particulars, the judge says, Carmen, do you agree that that, that, that sentence opens the door to the concept of recruiting based on violent videos? So that if that is a theme, if that's like, a chapter in a book recruiting based on violent videos. Zach talked about that. You asked him a question. He talked about that. So what I'm going to do is open the rest of that chapter up, but you would agree that that's okay. Right. And she says, your honor, as I tried to lay out in the emails, I don't think any of this is relevant. And judge says, oh, okay, well, please stay on topic. Carmen says, we will never get through this. If you don't stay on topic says now what I need to know, is why hasn't the door been opened? I'm inclined to think the door has been opened. The government thinks it's been opened. You, the defense, don't want any of this coming in. Why hasn't it been opened? Hernandez says, because he doesn't. And you see the transcript come to a screeching halt. Kelly reprimands Hernandez. He says, Miss Hernandez. Don't you turn your back and your head away on me. Scolds her with a reprimand for turning her head. Things are getting heated now, according to Brandy. Judge Kelly and Hernandez are going back and forth. Voices are raised. Judge, I sent this in an email. You're not reading my emails. You're not giving us an opportunity to be heard. Everything we say, you overrule. And then you're... And Judge Kelly's saying, don't you turn your back on me. He says, don't you get brazen with me right in the middle of federal court and says, Hernandez, you are being disrespectful. He says, listen to me right now. Stay on topic and look at me respectfully. Do you understand? Says Judge Kelly. Carmen says, Your Honor, I always look at you respectfully and always respect the court's ruling, which is not the case on the other side, pointing to the prosecutors. I turn around so I do not disrespect the court. He says, No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Hernandez. That is an inherent problem. 
And she says, well, I've got a problem too, Judge. The problem I have is an obligation under the Sixth Amendment to represent my client. I understand, and the judge says, I understand this. I understand the court is. And Hernandez says, no, I'm asking a question and I try to respond to the court first. Kelly says, the reason I cut you off, Carmen, and I'm sorry for that, is because I tee something up for you and then you don't address it. And so if I don't focus on the question, we'll never get through this, says the judge. And whether I do it or not, I don't want you turning your back on me disrespectfully again. Hernandez says, Your Honor, I would request the court allow me to make a record. Kelly says, You're entitled, but I'm trying to make an evidentiary ruling. But you don't have a right to wander onto topics I haven't asked you about. So I'm asking you to address the question of whether the door has been opened to impeach your client, yes or no. She says, My answer, as I already put in the email, Your Honor, is I do not believe so for multiple reasons. And then Carmen's phone goes off. Judge Kelly says, and on top of that, let me remind counsel to turn off all their devices. Or you'll be arrested. Probably her husband. Hey, baby, hope you're having a good day today. Just calling to see how your day's going. See you later. Good luck. Hernandez says, I feel your honor is if my ability to present a direct examination of my client has been hampered. And I feel we have to present these issues in a scrambled manner. That's the background of why I'm a little annoyed with this process, she says, slamming her phone down. A few moments later, she takes a look at her phone and she goes, oh, great. That's what it was. Wasn't my husband after all. Apparently, Zachary Real has just been doxxed by Antifa. Says, does he personally have some animus towards these people who believe they are violent? Yes. Have I brought that into the case? Carmen's, Carmen's fired up. Does he personally have animus towards these people who believe they are violent? Yes. Have I brought that into the case? No, because I think that's irrelevant. But if the government is going to try and bring this video in, I think he's entitled to explain why in private messages with his mother and brother, he was talking nastily, not nastily. He was just feeling that he was attacked and it's not personal. And he wasn't the only person attacked by this person. Rio was fired from his job because of the doxer, had a brick thrown into his home. And he shouldn't be able to explain should be able to explain why he felt this way. It shows restraint on his part. And the judge says, let's back up and not talking about the things I haven't admitted, but what we've already talked about. I've already admitted certain things and the reposting of certain videos is relevant after election. It is relevant to after election related conduct. And now as far as evidence of the defendant's intent and motive are concerned, your client is testifying on the stand that he did not do all the things he did not do. And he's testifying in part about his motive and his intent. And so I don't see in any world in which the things I've already admitted as relevant to his motive are not in play in this cross-examination. The judge is fired up. He says, I guess, you know, I'm flabbergasted, Miss Hernandez, that you would say, I don't think any of this could be a part of his cross because he has chosen to testify as is his right, as he's chosen to. He's a, he has a right to assert his innocence on the stand. This is his right. He's free to do that. But I don't understand, again, how. Again, let's put aside things I haven't admitted. And she says, the video, the video they want to introduce, Judge, is something you've already excluded. Kelly says, I'm aware of that, okay, Hernandez? But things I've already admitted for his motivation and intent are going to be permitted for his cross. She says, obviously, obviously. And he says, I just want to keep in perspective where we are here. We're talking about things that are not in evidence, already admitted for the purposes, and that's fine. But my point is, only I think, and maybe the devil is in the details, says the judge. I'm not as educated about the details as I need to be. But my point is only that it obviously should have been apparent to you, Ms. Hernandez, merely by taking the stand that a lot of this, anything already in, is going to be fair game. And she says, yeah, yes, judge, I know that. I'm a lawyer. I understand that is correct as long as it's being used properly. 
says, I could have brought up this doxing issue when Real's wife was on the stand. I could have brought up that he had a brick through, thrown through their house. She says that the government is attacking Real with his personal emails, talking about these people. And the messages where Real slammed the person who doxed him, who he says is Antifa, were personal and private, not about violence towards the government. And that's what this case is about. Bringing it in, allowing us to talk about all of it is just going to muddy the case, Judge. And I'm feeling distressed over this, she says. I'm just stressed over this coming in at this stage. And Kelly tells her, says, I didn't order the government to give this preview and reminds her at the close of the direct yesterday, he told her when the government produces materials to you, they should be prepared to highlight what I would rule on. Says we'll hash out the cross and what details should be. But given that the jury's waiting, my thought is right now to the extent and again, you've indicated this is news to you, but to the extent I've already admitted it for intent and motive, that's fair game to cross-examine him on. And with the door being open to recruitment, we're also getting into particulars. He says, I do think it is open. What it means as far as what the government is trying to do here, I don't think we should burn more time on it here. The jury's waiting. And in part, I haven't had a chance to look. Now, Kelly continues. None of this was on Pacer, she says. Yeah, all of this was done over email. That's why we don't have the documents and the specifics. Now, Hernandez is continuing on. She says, Your Honor, the FBI office in Boston just got involved with the Reels doxing episode, and she wants that information produced over to her. It was Antifa, not Antifa, whoever it is. I'm entitled to have that before I proceed with the direct examination. Judge says, is the government planning on producing that? Prosecutor says, yeah, she did email us last June for any contacts between real and a wide variety of topics. In response to that and other counsel and general discovery stuff, we did query the FBI Sentinel database for their names and we gave them everything we had. In some defendants, there were direct contacts with the FBI, but no reports from real to the FBI about any doxing or bricks. We never heard about that. We produced what we did have and we asked her if she had any more particulars. Never heard back. Now I understand this morning, she supplied us with a civil lawsuit complaint that makes reference to this years before in a parlor post. And the prosecutor says not to step into another prosecutor's lane, but we certainly would question the relevance of that, especially right now. Saying maybe other people made the report to the FBI. Hernandez says, no, Your Honor, an FBI agent that we spoke to knew about this case from 2018 and says, I'm entitled to get that information under the rules, under Brady, Giglio, everything. And they're going to salvage him and try to make him out. And I think that's Brady material. Due process and everything, I'm entitled to get it. Judge Kelly says, no, you're not. You're not entitled to a ruling before you've completed your direct. So you've got to make a strategic choice. What do you want to do? Do you want to get into that or not? And Hernandez looks over, says, how much time does it take for you to provide that information? I don't know, but you don't need that information to complete your direct, says the judge. He says, yeah. She says, yeah, I do. If I'm going to do my direct exam, I need that. Hernandez says, oh, gosh, all right. I need 15 minutes, Your Honor. I've been fighting at tilted windmills again. There's a brief sidebar. Calls her up, says, stop belittling the court take your 10 minutes wow so boy we've had a lot of activity yeah brandy buckman says we are having a morning and she capitalized a because it's true it is indeed a morning jury's not even been in yet and let's carry on let's do a water break my friends first it's cheers it's cheers times Cheers for a beverage break. Cheers to you on our beverage break. All right. Cheers, my friends. Let's get right back to it. And we're back. Zachary Real is on the witness stand. The jury enters. 
Hernandez says, well, this is before the jury enters. Hernandez says the FBI agent who had evidence of violence on Real's home, he was sent out of the courtroom, might be unavailable. Judge Kelly says, okay, look, at the moment, there's no reason for that agent or for the government to send him outside. There's a back and forth. Now, we still don't have the jury yet. Huh. Hernandez says, I said it was a possibility they sent him out to look for information. After a few minutes before the jury enters, Hernandez says she needs a personal break. Need a minute, Judge. No problem. Judge Kelly permits it. She leaves. Kelly says if the jury comes in while she's out, he'll turn them right back around until she returns. Hernandez steps out, comes back in. Jury is brought in. Now we continue. Zachary Real is back on the witness stand. Real is reminded he's still under oath, still in a dark suit, light shirt, blue and white striped tie. Hernandez says, all right, Mr. Real, good to see you again. Now I'm going to ask you some questions about activities with the Proud Boys and other events before January 6th. Let me first talk about Mr. Bertino. Now, you mentioned the term tip of the spear in your testimony. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember hearing uh, him saying that on video. Have you ever used that term? Tip of the spear? You know, I've never heard anybody say that. There's some crosstalk. He says, well, what I meant is I've never personally said it. No. Now, in any face-to-face -face conversations, you ever use that term? No, I've never used that term, tip of the spear. So let's talk about testimony that came out from Charles Donahoe, the guy who threw the water bottle at the police. Did you see that? No, I didn't see it happen. Wasn't anywhere near it. Did you speak to him before it happened? No, didn't at all. Tell me about Donahoe. He says, well, I met him before. I never saw him toss a water bottle at the police. Never saw him do anything violent towards the police at all. But what about at the Philly rally? He says, well, no one commented or committed any violence towards the police then. And you were there at the Ministry of Self-Defense chat at 1230 on 1230, December 30th? Yeah. And did you or did you not understand that he was agreeing to the concept of MOSD? Same problem as yesterday. They're saying Ms. Hernandez is testifying, getting a lot of objections. What was your understanding of Donahoe about his position on the chat? It says, I think he made it clear as day that the purpose of the chat was to reduce violence. Now, Brandy says Rio looks a lot more tense today. Seems like he's a bit fidgety and anxious. He goes to touch the mouse for the computer in front of him. And when Hernandez says, let's talk about Mr. Pozzola, he draws his hand back then turns his palm up like an I don't know, like this. Now, Hernandez takes a beat after asking if Real knows about Pozzola, now brings up text from two, December 2020. Says, did anybody introduce you to Pozzola? No. You ever spoke to him on the phone? Another co-defendant in the case. No, I never spoke to him. Do you ever exchange telegram messages with him? No. Any other way? No, not to my knowledge. And so if Pozzola popped up in the chat by chance, maybe he'd mentioned something. He said, you know, I don't even know. These guys all have weird names. Insert any ridiculous name. I don't know. But I didn't speak to him knowingly at all. Real testifies that he didn't know any Proud Boys were involved in any violence on 1-6 specifically didn't know that Pozzola allegedly broke a window until after the fact. Someone said afterwards that maybe one of our guys busted a window, but no, I didn't talk to Pozzola about that either. Now, Mr. Real, I want to ask you about the damage on January 6th. <clears throat> do you approve of that damage? Real says, I absolutely do not approve of any damage at the Capitol at all. It's a historic building, and I absolutely not. Did you see the window broken? 
Zach says, eventually I did. Eventually, when people were going up the steps, going up the side, I saw people going up the side. I said, let's check out what people are doing. Real calm up there, nothing going on, but rumors on the ground were that a window had been broken. So that's all I knew. Said the Capitol's huge. Which window? I didn't know until I'd actually seen it. Carmen asks. But at the time it was happening, you didn't see Pozzola breaking that window? He says, no, I wasn't in that area at all. Says, you brought a beer, bought a beer on the way to D.C. on January 5th. Is that right? He says, yeah. Now she asks about the quantity. He says it was a case of 30. Well, four cases of four 30 packs. Hopefully not, but light. Hernandez asks about Dick Sweats. He's back in the trial. And that's his real name. Dick Sweats is back. Real said he didn't bring Sweats into the chat. He says he thinks it was Jeremy Bertino who brought him in. Real says he was friends with Sweats, but didn't bring him into the chat. Says I brought in people that I trusted and knew. Says the proud boy who goes by the handle Leo also wasn't someone I brought into the chat. Now, did you hug any members of the marching group on January 6th? He says, hug anybody? I don't know. He says that he may have clapped someone in the back to greet them, but I don't know, he says. Hernandez shows an aerial shot from January 6th. He says, I want to show you this on the screen. Now, apparently this is from the time when Dominic Pozzola, who's also sitting there at the co-defendant's chair, he's wrestling the shield away from a police officer. And real is several yards away. The video shows him looking down at his phone in a huddle. He's just over there. He says, yeah, you know, that, that footage is really deceptive. He says, that makes me appear a lot closer than I am. He said, it was like a concert. He says, there were so many people, you just couldn't see above their heads, right? I couldn't see anything. What did you do there on your phone? He says, well, I took pictures with my phone. I wanted to record this so I could see what was happening later. He motions to how he did this. He raised his hands above the, his head above the hands above his head, miming with the phone in his hand. I put my hand up. I was taking pictures. From aerial footage, Hernandez asks real to identify a group of people. Well, who are these people? He says, well, I see myself there and that came in and they're spraying all over there. Video plays. Can you see yourself here hugging somebody? Oh yeah, I see that now. Who is that? He says, oh, that's Jenny. She's a photographer. Is she a proud boy? No, she's not a proud boy. Have you and Jenny ever met? Yeah, we met at a rally. When did you meet? At a rally. What were you talking about? You remember talking about anything? No, just what's going on. I mean, nothing really. And the video circles, other people, you weren't with them. You weren't nearby with them. He says, right there? No, they play some more video. Mob is pushing up against the barrier. Police release a chemical spray. Real says at this time, okay, that's me. I'm off there to the side. He was jumping up and down so that he could see what was happening, right? He's actually jumping so he could see physically what's going on, get a better vantage point. A couple of the Philly Proud Boys came up and they're in the picture. We see Brian Helian and Freedom Vi, whoever they are. What time did you stop hanging around with Biggs and Nordeen? He says, well, it was literally a minute from now in the video, maybe two minutes tops. Police threw another one of their garden hose spraying off the crowd and I took off. That was about 1.18 p.m. Now he's testifying. He's squeezing in side remarks, she says, that sound like he's sort of being defensive. If, the, if they're looking for a more remorseful sounding defendant, they're not getting it is what she says. Now, Carmen asks this question. At that time, did you go past the police? No. Did you destroy any property? No, I did not. Now, did you follow, did Biggs follow real on parlor or Biggs? No, I didn't, no, I don't think so. Did Tario? 
No, I don't. I think he did, but he followed a lot of other people. Did Pozzola follow you on Parler? He says, I have no idea. Do you follow Pozzola on Parler? I don't think so. Now, when Tario was released from jail, did he call you? No. Any conversations with Tario on the phone January 4th, 5th, or 6th? No. They play footage from the LA Times. It shows Charles Donahoe throwing something toward the police in the background. Cops are struggling to hold the line. Real says he was nowhere near this scene at all. No, I don't see Biggs. I don't see Nordine. I don't see, I don't see anybody over there. Now, when we left off yesterday, I asked you a couple of questions about Biden and the Biden presidency. Did you send any messages about accepting the fact that Biden was president? He said, yeah, I accepted that fact. I sent messages to people where I specified I didn't think Trump was going to, you know, win the legal process. I said to people the next day that we needed to start preparing for a Biden presidency. What does that mean? Well, there were a lot of people holding out hope. You know, again, we spoke to Mastriano and we spoke to these other guys asking if they could pull a rabbit out of a hat, you know, legally. But after one six, I knew how it worked. End of the line, guys. Got to prepare for Biden. He's the president now. Do you accept that Biden is the president today? He says, yeah, absolutely. Now, Real sits still for a moment, but then fidgets with his computer mouse a little bit in the witness box. He says, now, can you tell me about definitions about the degrees of membership in the Proud Boys? It depends who you ask. What about your membership? Well, I was a fourth degree, and I became a fourth degree because I was assaulted. Said the person was trying to spit on another Proud Boy, and I stepped in the way and got spit on. And that gave me the fourth degree. Now we ask about Telegram messages. He says, that's just a miscategorized messaging app. Explains it. He says, if you DM someone, it only goes to that one person. He says, yeah. What about group chats? You were involved in some? I was involved in some, but not the others. Any idea how the maximum number of people can be in the chat? I don't know, maybe 100, 200. If somebody invites you, are you automatically accepted? He says, well, it depends on the chat settings. He says, what about the notifications? Do you get all the notifications in your chat? He says, no, of course not. If you're on Telegram, and by the way, our members have a Telegram, private Telegram, join as a member today, get access. But our private Telegram, there's a ton of notifications because it's so active and fun. And so you might want to mute those. He says, all my notifications were off. And so if someone posted a chat, you wouldn't even be notified? He says, no, I wouldn't unless they posted a pin. That was a rare thing. If it was pinned, maybe then I'd be able to see it. Now we're going through the Telegram conversation. He's explaining how it works. And he says, in your personal experience, did you read all of the chats? No, I didn't read all of the chats. There's not enough time in the world to read them all. It's impossible. He says, now, there is a video of Pozzola inside the Capitol smoking. Do you recall that? He says, yeah, I do. And he says something about taking the Capitol, something like that, or was that not on your phone? He says, well, the video was on my phone, but it was actually on the cloud. It's, if it's on Telegram, it's on the cloud. Did you watch the video on January 6th? No. Says on January 6th, I had no internet service on my phone at the time. Tech service, but I could barely get any app at all. At the height of the protest, there was barely any cell service. So he brings up a chat from Real. On 1-7, he says, I find this hard to believe now. I'm proud as heck of what we accomplished yesterday. But we need to start planning, and we are starting to plan for a Biden presidency. Somebody else writes, have faith, brothers. We did our part yesterday. And another message was deleted. Hernandez says, what did this message mean? He said, I meant the protest. You know, it never happened like 1-6 before. What I saw was huge crowds of people waving flags, protesting, and I was proud to be a part of something like that. It was historic. He says about the, pri the Biden presidency, why'd you say that? I said that just to stop with the conspiracies. 
Now, what did you see on January 6th? Well, I saw people shaking gates over there. Honestly, that what was going down. I knew of protests going on at the Capitol. I saw some earlier. You're saying that's all you thought was happening was just protest? He said, when we collided with that crowd of people, that crowd was really rowdy. And when they started shaking the gate, I heard it. And I went over there to investigate the scene and to see what was going on. So I saw some people being rowdy, shaking barriers at the time, going through my head. I thought these people must know where the stages are. He's, and he says, you're giving me this look, but it's the honest to God truth. That's your perception of what happened? He says, yeah. They play the video. Somebody in the video says, F it, storm the Capitol. They say, Zach, is that you? He says, no, that's not me. I didn't hear anyone say that at the time. I hear it now, but I didn't hear it then. He says, I was further back in the crowd. I didn't see anything advancing. Now we get to the man with the black megaphone. He's saying F Antifa. He says, yeah, this guy was there. He had his whole crowd of people lined up. Did you ever meet him? No, never met him before. Did you watch Jeremy Bertino's podcast? He said, well, I very rarely watched it. What about this podcast from Biggs? No, I never watched them either. That's not to say I wouldn't have shared one but I don't like watching podcasts. That's unfortunate. Did anybody try to rein in the violence on the day? He says, well, ultimately, we try to make it a national standard to avoid violence. Says, was 1-6 a Proud Boy rally? Says, no, not really. As the chapter of the president uh, of Philly, you sometimes had rallies? He says, yeah, I've done events but you didn't personally organize something in 2020. He said, I did personally organize one, didn't personally organize it. And when you do organize something, you have control over what happens. He says, maybe I try to, but I can only worry about myself. If I'm organizing an event, I have a lot more leeway and power to decide when and where we're gonna meet up. Talk about the stabbing debacle in 1212. says, wasn't the chat supposed to react differently to these events? Not that I recall. Real says the Proud Boys from California wouldn't fly all the way out, but they came out for a national event. Court breaks for lunch. Kind of slow testimony this morning. Scheduling conflict tomorrow. So we've got some lingering motions. Fifty-fifty confidence that we'll have closing arguments next week. Not sure. Lunch is over. Zach Real is back on the witness stand. Jury is back out. Starting nine thirty a.m. Monday. Now, Stephen Metcalf for attorney Dominic for Dominic Pozzola says lunchtime Thursday they'll be done. Now, the, you may have to keep Miss Hernandez from talking. Good luck. You've managed to hurt both of her feelings, they say. Wisecrack got laughter from the courtroom. And they're trying to make the peace in the courtroom. Now back to business. Hernandez wants to bring up how two of the people who traveled were charged with misdemeanors. Already been excluded. The jury's coming back. And we're back on the stand. They're playing videos and says, any info you can provide about who yelled that out, that we're going to storm the Capitol? He says, I mean, look, I have an iPhone. Everyone has an iPhone, knows they're not cheap. The technology is designed to pick up sounds. I, I observe this. There's a guy screaming behind me, but I don't know who it is. He's right behind me. He's right behind me there. Sounds like he's closer than he is. Video plays, reels confused, pointing out this guy. Who is shouting storm the Capitol. Man is older, white, gray-haired goatee. Testimony is a little bit confusing. He says, you can hear my voice and distinguish it from the others. He says, you and your proud boys had no intention to attack the Capitol. No intent. 
Absolutely not. Never did it ever cross my mind to attack the Capitol. Did you ever say anything? Did Nordine ever say anything about attacking the Capitol? No. Biggs? No. He said, I had a bunch of thoughts going through my head at once about the guy with the black megaphone. There were supposed to be stages set up. And I'm not trying to downplay anything here, but he says this scene, it was a huge crowd of people trying to find the stages. That's what people do at concerts. A lot of people do that. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. And to push those barriers, it didn't really phase me at the time. People just push barriers over. They bring up some parlor posts and some of the things that he posted. He said, this is what patriotism looks like in the chat. What does that mean? He says, well, you can po po vote people out of office if they feel their job is on the line. But what did you intend by that phrase? Did it have anything to do with beating up the cops? No. And as you sit here today, Zach, what is your opinion of what happened on January 6th? He says, I think what ultimately unfolded, all the violence was a disgrace, I do. Ultimately, it's not the sole reason, but it didn't do any good. It didn't do Trump any good that day. It disrupted the legal process. And like I said, anybody who assaulted the cops, they're charged with that and rightfully so. At the time I was down there, it looked like a giant protest. I saw a little bit of scuffles, nothing out of the ordinary. I've been to many protests. Things happen to protests and sometimes, but at the end of the day, I thought it was a protest. And that's what I went there for. And when I left, that's what it was. Do you know this guy, Jake Phillips in the Proud Boy Chats? And brings up Jeremy Bertino, somebody who already pled guilty to seditious conspiracy. Says, was Jeremy Bertino a Proud Boy? Was he violent? Real says, yeah. Bertino appears to be the aggressor that day. And ironically, he was in the leader's chat. That's the kind of behavior we wanted to rein in. I left the Capitol at 3.30, went out and got drunk with my friends. Proceedings were suspended at some point. Lawmakers said they would object. Of course, they counted the votes that same night. It says, after I got done eating, relaxed, I said to everybody, hey, we got to prepare for Biden. And they stuck around. They'll stay in a park, just make their voices heard. Now, what is your assessment today of what happened? And how it affected the votes of the congressman. He says, well, like I said, that they did have an effect on what they did. They were mad about it and they blamed Trump for it. Okay. That's not a great answer. It's, it's, that's what they're trying to prove. That they actually did interfere, right, with the proceedings. It did have an effect. He's obviously acknowledging that. I bet, the, I bet the prosecutors hit that in closing. Uh, it says, I guess you could say rightfully so. The people who committed violence, like I said earlier, they ruined the legal process that Trump tried to put in place. Carmen Hernandez then plays a video for the jurors. A little bit hard to hear. Somebody's talking about some conspiracy theories, maybe. Here, Hernandez shows another text. Somebody said, can't wait for the lawsuits. More footage from Zach Real. Woman is being knocked over the crown of her head. Says, Zach, what was your understanding of this? He says, my understanding here is this woman took an American flag off somebody and swiped a knife at somebody's face. And a bridge of their nose and somebody came over and knocked her out. Proud Boys particularly were pretty uptight about knives. Was, your, was it your intent to promote violence when you shared video reel? No, actually, it was showing the reason she was knocked out because she had a knife and somebody stopped the threat. Prosecutors are calling objections. Hernandez pausing, taking her time, looking through notes, spending a solid minute in the courtroom in silence, two to three minutes. H Carmen holds her finger up and says, I'll tell you in one minute, when Kelly reminds her to use the mic because he can't hear her, Kelly leans back in his chair. Take your time, Carmen. 
Now, video's pulled up. It's from inside the Capitol in the Senate wing. Looks thick. People are already in the hallway. People are pouring in. A lot of people outnumbered. Carmen asks Zach, did any of these officers ask you to not come into the Capitol? No, they didn't. Other people are pouring through the doors. He IDs Brian. The video continues. Reels watching. He yawns widely in court. Were Biggs, Nordine, Tario, and Pozzola in this group? No. Zach, do you know any of these people? Circle's a big area. No, I do not. Now, did you know at this time that Pence was in the, wasn't in the building? Yes, I got that message. I knew he was evacuated. So you knew that there were no Congress people inside? He says, yeah. What did that mean to you? Well, it meant to me that I didn't know exactly why they stopped. Obviously, going in there, you could see a little bit. Two and two people had probably put something together. Two and two put two and two together. That's why they left. Hernandez is still going through her notes. Norm Pattis is squeezing the bridge of his nose. He's like this. Oh, gosh. Real says that footage Hernandez pulls up shows him looking for a bathroom. He walked to the end of the hallway and found one. Real says when he was leaving, he left around 3.30. He couldn't get an Uber. So he walked. Did you use any force on January 6th? No. Did you conspire or agree to use any force on January 6th? No. Did Biggs do any of that? No. Did Pozzola? No. Tario? No. Bertino? No. Nordin? No. No. What was your intent on January 6th? My intent? Zach says, my intent was just to participate in a protest and to have my voice heard. On January 6th, she asks, did you act corruptly? <laughs> That's from the Court of Appeals opinion. Objection calls for a legal conclusion sustained. Not allowed to ask that one. She asked for a sidebar. Now she comes back, rephrases. Did you stand to gain any benefit personally? No. Personally? No. Did anyone pay you money to be there? Did anyone offer you a bribe? No. Did anybody offer you a bribe to do whatever it is you did? He says, I mean, I didn't do anything but walk around all day. What the hell are you talking about? Did you accept any bribes on behalf of Mr. Trump? No. Did you agree with Nordine to accept any bribes? No. Did you intend to obstruct, impede any proceedings? No. Did you intend to influence the proceedings? Well, it depends on what you're asking. We hope the legal process would play out in favor of Trump, but it needed to play out. And that's the thing. It needed to play out. Did you gain any financial benefit from being there? I mean, no, specifically, no. Did you intend to obstruct a proceeding? No, I didn't go in until there wasn't anyone in there. The Capitol is a public building. I thought it was fair game to go in. Zach, did you conspire to use force, intimidate, or threaten any person? No, scratches his face, leans into the microphone. No, his hands are still fidgety on the desk. Now, Hernandez is going down the charges one by one, just asking questions. It's been asked and answered, sustained. If the plan was for Hernandez to go slowly today, she's doing a great job, says Brandy. Still going down a long list. And still going. So apparently going very slowly. Still going down the charges. Did he... Did ask real, did anyone throw a water bottle at a law enforcement officer? Did you aid anyone when they threw that very deadly insurrectionary water bottle? No. Did you abet them? No. Brandy goes upstairs for 10 minutes. Says jurors are sort of paying attention. At least three jurors looked very tired. One juror is leaning back. One juror dropped his hands down. Another juror is resting their head on their hand, looking quite tired. No note-taking. On a brief break. And we're talking about who is up next. Because remember, we have a bunch of co-defendants, and the co-defendants may want to also ask questions of this witness. So in other words, Enrique Tario might have questions for Zach. Let's see how they settle it. Kelly decides to let Enrique Tario 
conduct a direct exam of Zachary Real. Says, how long is this going to go? Well, it says until the end of the afternoon, probably. And the prosecutor leans back in his chair and drops his arms. He's frustrated. I wanted to cross-examine him today, Judge. Meh. And so now the defense is going to get to ask some other questions. Defense attorney says, I don't know how long it's going to take. I'm not sure if the government. So the defense might be stalling here, <laughs> like for real. Are they are they trying to serve Ray Epps? Do they have a pole vaulter at Ray Epps' house trying to get a subpoena to him? Feels like they might be trying to squeeze this into another day. <laughs> Because they're not coming back tomorrow. That's exactly what they're doing, aren't they? So they're not coming back tomorrow. So they're just letting this puppy linger. That's hysterical. Okay. So Jaraguay says, gosh, I don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, this might take several hours. I have no idea. The government, if they gave me the same courtesy, if they don't object every question, maybe we'll get through this. So now Jaraguay comes up to conduct his direct exam. Have you ever testified at a trial before? You ever take moot court, objection sustained? When was the first time you met Tario, he says. Timing's totally off. Maybe 2019, I'm not sure. Are you guys friends? I mean, yeah. Are you besties or best friends? He says, well, I don't call him up all the time. I mean, I'm friendly with him, and I'd call him a friend. Now, how do you view him as a leader? Well, he says, hard to hear, actually. Couple objections. How would you describe your actions in getting the Proud Boys to relate to each other? He says, oh, it's a constant battle. You know, there are so many people across the country, so many different mindsets. Some people are more agreeable than others. Some people like to drink. Some people like to get in chats and some people don't. Different parts of the country, all are different. Each chapter is autonomous. And he says, okay, so there are some different groups within the Proud Boys. Some are very aggressive. Some are like crazed monkeys. He says, yeah, they're generally just hard to organize if this is where they're going. Were the chats busy? Yeah, chats were very busy. Hundreds of participants. I wouldn't read every message. And she's saying, we already did this with Hernandez. Was it Tario's job? She's, he's asking about his client now. This is Enrique Tario's lawyer. Was it Tario's job to reject or rebuke any kind of speech on these chats? He says, no. I mean, same thing with me. I mean, you're in there. You see somebody saying something, he's been in the chat before, he's seen somebody say something and said, no, that's stupid or whatever, just like I have, but it's not his job, it's not his duty, and I don't have time to be in every single chat and tell every single person I agree with or don't agree with. He said, you said that they were grown-ass men in there, is that true? He said, yeah, that's right, they're responsible for their own speech. And you said that, oh yeah, it was accepted by the Proud Boys to be edgy, is that true? He said, yeah, you know, push the envelope, the later in the night it gets, the edgier the Proud Boys would get. You know, they're trying to one-up each other in their chats. And said, does Enrique, my client, does he say outrageous things just to get media attention? Objection sustained. Does Enrique Tario, my client, troll people? Says, yeah. Well, basically, if you say something outrageous on social media, you can generate likes and clicks or shares. He says, you know, social media, the thing is, it's all powered by algos. Don't forget to like this video wherever it is you're watching it and leave a comment and subscribe and share with your friends. Whatever happens, it powers the algorithm. So some guys, if it's not getting enough engagement, they'll say something outrageous. Tario would troll online and then he would pull back. Apparently, Well, I don't know if this is from Brandy or if that's in testimony. Apparently a flag is burned somewhere. Somebody burned a flag. Was part of the function to go out and get your picture taken by the media? He says, well, it, de it depends. A lot of the time we did it to raise awareness and show people that we could throw a rally and be peaceful. And part of the image was to put a positive image out there. He says, yeah, we tried to show that we're doing good things. We're not always as bad as people say we are. We do these marches for a reason. Do you think the Proud Boys image was distorted by the media? Yeah, I think a lot of it was. For an outsider looking in, they don't understand our culture. 
We joke around with each other. An outsider looking in might think we're horrible people, but to us, they're not part of the fraternity and they don't understand what it's like. Now, how did you become, do you know how, how did Real know that Tario was a proud boy? He says, how did you know that Tario was a proud boy? He told me. Jaraguay is laughing and smiling, having fun. Kinnearson is not, which is typical. Jaraguay is a defense attorney. Kinnearson a prosecutor. So that's just normal. Now there was enough, this is the, this is, you know, in their natural habitats, prosecutors are just those types of people. Now there was another minute or two of direct by Jaraguay, but I missed it. Now Kinnearson asked to go into a sidebar. Did Tario ever march you into danger? Zach says, no. Did he ever march you away from danger? I don't understand what you mean. Did he ever march you away from, you know, Antifa, for example? He says, yeah. Did you and the Proud Boys, you specifically, did you respect other people's right to protest? He says, yes, absolutely. Do you think BLM has an absolute right to protest? He says, yes, they do. Did any other group in opposition to the Proud Boys have a right to protest? Yes, they do. Now, at some point, did your feelings towards law enforcement ever change? Zach, no, they didn't. Did Tario dislike or insult law enforcement? No, he worked with them. Did you ever see Tario disrespect a cop in front of you? Did you ever see him hit or assault one? Did Enrique try to protect law enforcement? He says, from what I've seen, yes, he did. Now, how do you feel about law enforcement, Zach? Do you respect law enforcement? He says, yes, I do. Well, I want to pull up this chat where there was a message that you sent that said real stuff. Don't cop cooperate with the cops. They aren't my fr our friends. They want to be, but they aren't allowed. They will take any of your statements, give them to the Soros paid for DA, which is a whole different ballgame. What did he mean by that? Official president's chat. Maybe this is a statement from Enrique. What did he mean by that? No, it's a real statement. Zach says, I meant if you're doing anything illegal, speeding or anything, they'll just take your statement and that's that. You'll face the consequences. Were you calling for violence against the police? I just said, don't, don't cooperate, not attack cops or anything like that. Now, this is moving fast. Bringing up other messages. Real says, don't trust the FBI. There's an objection that is sustained. He says, was law enforcement present, Zach, on July 4th, 2020? Yeah. Did you say my client talking to cops that day? Yeah, all day he was talking to the cops. Who created the Ministry of Self-Defense chat, Enrique? And it was created in response to what? The stabbing on the 12th. Multiple members were stabbed on the 12th. Yeah, multiple members and even prior to that. Tario was part of a stabbing event even before that. Brandy says, very same, similar testimony, different flavor. Who would be a bad candidate for the leadership chat? Well, we didn't want people looking for trouble. We wanted to go do our protest. And if we needed to protect ourselves, we would. But nobody aggressive. Now, Jared Gwai, the defense attorney, brings up the accordion issue from the uh, yesterday. He says, is it how to march so you don't run into each other in this accordion form format? Real says, well, the age is very vast and we have guys who are all age groups. Backwards, we've got different fitness levels. Some of the guys with lower fitness standards are a bit older. They would fall behind in the line and that's when we made the accordion thing happen and the group would just stretch. That would be a problem because they might lose guys and if they lose them, we might lose them to Antifa or something like that. They ask about the radios says the radios were working on January 6th. We've heard testimony about all over the place. According to Real, they were working. Others have said they were not. Zach, were there any nefarious reasons why you joined this chat? No, I agreed to take leadership because I thought it'd be beneficial. I thought it was a great opportunity to get as much of the issue under control as possible. I want to bring up this December 30th Proud Boys conference call. Were the Proud Boys speaking in some special code that only prosecutors understand? 
<laughs> Objection, argumentative, sustained, of course, but it's a great question. Can you translate this from FBI to English? From DOJ prosecutor speak to real world. Objection sustained. He reframes it. He says it was a private chat. If we weren't telling the very guys we were recruiting for this truth, then there were guys we were bringing in. There were guys who were doing this exactly. He says there was no code. So you weren't recruiting an army to come here to the Capitol on January 6th, were you, Zach? Sustained as to argumentative. Were you looking for a fighting force? On January 6th? No, I was not. I want to bring up another chat. What was going on here on January 4th? Enrique Tario was arrested on January 4th. What for? Vandalism. What happened there? He said, yeah, after Enrique got arrested, that was a monkey wrench in the whole thing. Tries to admit the side, the Selbright report. Objection. Now, what was your understanding as to the voice notes with Tario speaking? We didn't know about the vandalism charge. What was the plan if Enrique didn't get arrested? What were you guys going to do on January 6th? He was supposed to be giving speeches, at least one that I know of. Oh, so Enrique was not going to be insurrecting the Capitol. He was supposed to be giving speeches. Interesting. After the speech, what was the plan for you and the Proud Boys? Well, we were going to march around like we always did. And knowing Enrique, he would have tried anything, objection, non-responsive, move to strike, sustained. They are dropping objections. Basically every other question, it looks like. Enrique was going to give a speech and you do a march and a rally. Yeah, he sighs briefly. <sighs> Probably where we went at the end and dispersed from there. Did Enrique Tario invite Pozzola into the chat? No. Did he invite Pozzola into this other chat? No. Do you remember who invited Pozzola into the chat? I don't even know who Pozzola was at the time. And I never even bothered to look. Do you know who created the 1776 returns document? No, I don't. He's laughing. I've heard things in this courtroom, but I've never even seen this document before in my life. You ever receive it in an email or a chat? No. You ever read it or possess it in any way? No. Was the 1776 returns document discussed in any chat whatsoever? Not any chat I ever paid attention to. And if it was, I didn't see it. On January 6th, were you acting in any sort of a plot or plan from 1776 returns the document? No. Did Enrique ever tell you about 1776 returns? If he did, we would have spoken about it in the chats and you'd be reading about it right now. Was 1776 returns ever discussed at the meetings like the dunk tank video or at other meetings? No, it was not discussed. What was the gist of the dunk tank? Well, like I said, it was for Enrique to be questioned by the presidents throughout the country. If they were raising issues, give him an opportunity to address their concerns. And did you discuss what was going to happen on 1-6 in those videos? Says, I don't think so. If, if it was brought up, it was generalized and not related to the purpose of the chat in the first place. Bunch of objections are coming out. The defense asks Zach, Mr. Real, why didn't you wear your colors to the protests on 1-6? says, right before January 6th, there was an event in Georgia, and I believe Enrique showed up to that, and he showed up there, and the chapter didn't want him there. They made it loud and clear. And the Georgia guys were mad after seeing what happened in December, after some other guys got stabbed. And so the Proud Boys negotiated between themselves, don't wear colors on 1-6. And you said previously, Zach, that Tario's plan was to go speak at some stage somewhere. Yeah, maybe not before the march, give or take, but it never came to fruition, obviously. Is that because Tario was arrested? Yeah, it's true. And once arrested, did he give any direction from his jail cell insurrection plot that he was going to embark on on 1-6? Did he tell you anything about it? Real says no. I mean, he told us he wasn't even allowed in the city anymore, so it was completely off the table. He was ordered to leave D.C., 
but he still went to a meeting with Stuart Rhodes. <laughs> Stuart Rhodes, who's an oathkeeper, which is the same oathkeeper organization to which Ray Epps belonged some time ago. Very interesting dynamics going on here. So Real testifies that he had no, none understanding of any plan. Norm Pattis, another defense attorney at the table, drafts a note and they slide that over there to another attorney. Jaraguay picks it up, he reads it and he says, oh, good question. Mr. Real, do you remember what Matthew Green said during his testimony? Says, no, I, no, he was one of the early ones. I can't remember. Did Bertino testify to any specifics? Did you agree with Mr. Bertino's testimony? Objections, objections, objections. Bertino understood there was a metaphorical ob objection. Did you share Bertino's objective for January 6th? No, and I don't know how he came up with it. Jaraguay smiling and laughing now. Prosecutors are objecting, he's just laughing. Jaraguay seems really tickled with himself when he draws a, an objection, reframes it, draws another objection. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a weird dynamic in this courtroom. You can tell that they these sides basically hate each other's guts at this point. Do you know Kenny Lazardo? Yeah, I do, says Zach. He was a proud boy from the Boston chapter, met him quite a few times. He expressed interest in joining the Philly chapter, moving down to the area, but he never did. Jaraguay pulls up a still from a video. He says, who is this person in the circle? Oh, that person? That's Kenny Lazardo. Tario is standing to his left. Jaraguay asks where they're located. He says, it looks like a courthouse or a jail, barely visible. Was Lizardo picking up Tario from jail here? Objection, leading, sustained. Prosecutors melt down over this one because they know where this is going. Remember, we know that Kenny Lizardo is a confidential human source, FBI informant, or some other informant. There are many other informants there. And Kenny Lizardo was picking up the leader of the Proud Boys, Enrique Tario, from jail on January 4th. There's a photograph of it. They're trying to show it to the jurors and educate them that this case was filled with feds everywhere. In fact, they were so embedded that they were picking up the leader of the Proud Boys from jail. Prosecutor's objection, ah, don't let that in. They talk to the judge. The silver, this sliver of video with Lizardo and Tario was from the day Tario was arrested, appears to be footage shot by Nick Kested. Sidebar's over. They go back. Lizardo was trying to become a member of your chapter, Zach? Yeah. How do you know? He told me. You remember how you met him? Did you know at the time? that Kenny Lazardo was a confidential human source for the FBI? At the time, I did not know. They want to play another video from the day of the arrest. Objection, sidebar. Playing the video, no audio. Who's this man driving the car? Oh, that's Kenny Lazardo. Can you see who is here in the back seat? Enrique Tario. Any personal knowledge as to when this video is from? Yeah, it's right after he got picked up from, j objection, objection. At this time, right after he got picked up from jail, right? Because he picked up Enrique Tario. An FBI informant picked up the leader of the seditionist conspiracy and brought him back to DC. At the time, you didn't know that Lizardo was reporting yours and Enrique's activities to the FBI. Objection. Did you know that Lizardo was an informant at the time? No, I did not know that. What were some of the objectives that you agreed on in any way? Somebody sent a text message. Why did he write that? He says, well, because he didn't discuss anything. It's January 5th. It's 940. I'm in DC. We didn't coordinate anything. And so whether we're going to stages or not, I had no idea what was going on. How did you know how to meet people at the Washington Monument? He says, one person created the message. Everybody forwarded the message. One person can create it. We're going to the monument. Everybody sends it around all the telegram groups. 
says, besides meeting at the Washington Monument, any other agreements that morning? No, there wasn't. Any objectives that morning? No, there was not. They play another clip. Jaraguay, the defense, asks real, why would you say, make sure there's no press around? You said that, right? Yeah. Why'd you say that? As I spoke about earlier, he said, people go to great lengths to dox and the media show up to locations and they try to record somebody like me. I'm a bit more known guy in Philly. I'm not particularly worried about being doxed anymore. I should emphasize that. Some guys still have jobs. They don't want to get doxed. We try to keep the press away from our group and the people that we're with. And they're talking about doing a meet and greet at this current location. Again, the Washington Monument. Why did you develop a front line? Same questions. It was a way to keep guys in line so the middle doesn't get too fat and extend it out. They play another clip. What are you guys doing here? We're just walking around. Any secret agreements? No, just walking. Any secret plans or understandings? No, none. Did you develop an implicit understanding walking in front with the leaders? No. Are you sure? Yeah, we barely even talked. <laughs> so when you were up front, you weren't plotting on with your insurrection you know, plans? No, you're just marching around, man. I thought I heard Kelly say earlier we had a hard out. And so we'll see where this goes. Jaraguay is continuing, plays a video, Nordine's using a bullhorn. Objection is sustained on that. Defense says, Jaraguay, you were there right here? Yeah. At the monument? Yeah. To the point here that you're stopped, right? Yeah. Do you think the words coming out of Nordine's mouth are true? He's talking, not talking a secret code, right? Like no Proud Boy secret handshake stuff. Objection, argumentative, sustained. Jaraguay says, is, Nord is Nordine speaking in Minecraft? <laughs> he must have a kid who's playing Minecraft because, you know, or something. Maybe an adult who's playing Minecraft because it's a pretty damn great game. Zachary Real says, you see what was going on was making complete sense. Objection, sustained. So the Minecraft comment got an objection <laughs> and, and a non-responsive one now after the capital what was the plan he says to, to turn back and go to a rally here in this video are you chanting f antifa this sounds like it might be kind of your greatest hit he says yeah it gets kind of old yeah it's what we say a lot but yeah it's kind of a greatest hit Still no plans among them at this point either, Jaraguay says. More video is being played. Do you know a lady by the name of Aaron, uh, Amy Harris, Zach? Yeah, she's a photographer. She's with you this whole time? Yeah, she's front and center with us the whole time. Says it's kind of tough to do a conspiracy with the entire media watching you, isn't it? Objection, sustained. Jaraguay plays a video of the Proud Boys. They're in a prayer circle probably a terrorist prayer circle. Maybe the FBI should infiltrate that group along with their other informants. Oh, I forgot. They already did embed informants in their prayer circles, probably informants in that circle too. As it plays, Jaraguay asked the group if they're, heard, if they're heard saying, soften the hearts that are harder. Do you hear them saying, soften the hearts that are harder there? Little insurrectionist prepar preparatory prayers. Kinnearson, the prosecutor objects, it's sustained. Jaraguay says, were you guys praying to stop the certification? <laughs> He's got such an attitude. I love it. Objection, argumentative. So there's more F Antifa chanting in the video. Jaraguay asks real, can you see Nordine making a hand gesture towards a man in the street? I'm not sure. Plays it again. You see him waving? Yeah. Why do you do it? Objection sustained. Was the hand gesture meant to shoo an older man away? Can a large group of Proud Boys just stop on a dime, he asks? No, they can't. What happens if a large group of guys just stops? Yeah, they bump into each other. All right, where'd the Proud Boys have lunch? These are the food trucks. Is this a good stopping place? Oh, Kelly asks Jaraguay. Is this a good stopping place? 
Jarek Wise like, yes, perfect. Got exactly what we needed. Just needed to squeeze out the rest of the day into a Thursday, Friday break. <laughs> perfect. Kelly, as you know, you're not sitting tomorrow. You're sitting on Monday. Remember, Carmen Hernandez needed a little bit more time because she has a whole uh, cross-examination to prepare for that's going to be bringing in a bunch of other stuff. And so we've got the defense team. Feels like they're kind of working together and uh, extending the case out. And so Kelly says, as you know, you're not sitting tomorrow or Friday. You're sitting Monday morning. So we'll reach out to you with the, with the time. We'll reach out to you. Please avoid all the media. Says, I'm waiting to see if he's going to drag this out into Monday. This case is never ending. She says, my body's going to fuse to the chair. <laughs> Jerry leaves. Judge Kelly says, do you want to waive Nordine's presence for tomorrow? Tomorrow, they're going to be working out jury instructions and other legal matters. Okay, so the jurors won't be seated, but they'll still be in court tomorrow to hash out the jury instructions. They're waiving their rights for them to appear. So in other words, the defendants, these Proud Boys, will not be transported back over into court tomorrow since they're just going to talk about law stuff. Patty says, I want to remind the court about Biggs's need to be out tomorrow. Good luck on that, Mr. Biggs. So Mr. Biggs is maybe going through a procedure or something. Hernandez says that Zachary Real will come to court tomorrow. And the judge says, given that how today has gone, I'm afraid we're going to have unexpected issues start up tomorrow too. So let's start at 9 a.m., not 9.30. We'll be here early. We're not starting late since we have to fight over everything the judge is like. I'm going to make you get here earlier, given the unexpected nature of this afternoon's testimony. That's it from our friend Brandy Buckman over on Twitter. Make sure you're giving her a great follow. They have been working hard bringing us this trial. She's at Brandy underscore Buckman on Twitter. We're very grateful for all of her work. But that is it today on day 54 of the Proud Boys trial. And I thought we were gonna hear from Dominic Pozzola, but we had some interesting developments. We had Zachary Reel on the stand, pretty standard testimony. We had some interesting rulings from the judge, which means that the cross-examination might be able to get into a bunch of other things because the judge is finding that Carmen Hernandez and actually this witness opened the door to some further inquiry. And we'll see if there's any other additional filings that come in tonight. I expect that there will be. Tomorrow, there will be more motions. They will talk about the jury instructions. We generally skip the jury instructions here because jury instructions, reading how they assemble jury instructions is literally reading how they are reading the words in a sentence and marking them off and changing the words and moving things around. So it's pretty brutal to do in person. It's even more brutal to talk about other people doing it. So we'll, we, we go through the jury instructions when they are completed, but there were a bunch of other rulings or motions that we're waiting for rulings on, including some additional motions to dismiss. And today we saw that Carmen Hernandez filed a motion for third party guilt, trying to point the fingers at other people who were there on January 6th. This trial is a doozy. We'll continue to follow. Thank you for joining us as we do. Thank you for liking this video. Thank you for sharing it with a friend or inviting them to come in and join us as we talk about this trial and more. We'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. Now, my friends, let's see what you have to say about all of this. I saw some amazing super chats come in. I saw some amazing new members join us, courtesy of some very generous contributors. And we wanna welcome everybody over into our amazing new community. I also see Rumble is, is poking around over there. Shout out to Rumble. We've got Twitter that we're going to check in here on a minute as well. But let's get the screens queued up and see who is in the chat. My goodness. Who else do we have in here? Okay. So awesome. Let's see who we had some membership gifts come in and Vienticus prime is very awesome. We want to welcome dolphin fan. Thank you. Dolphin fan for gifting some amazing names, amazing people coming in. We are welcoming John trigger, Diane, Matt Olson, and Bruce Leroy 
all coming in the house, courtesy of our friend, Dolphin Fan. Thank you, Dolphin. And hey, our, our newest members, make sure you grab the Telegram link. It's in the community post section. For members, we do morning we do morning headline streams. We went for about an hour this morning talking about all the news of the day. It's a ton of fun. We have a great place to post on locals. We do after parties. So make sure you join us. This, even though we finish here, we're not done. We're going to keep chatting away for a little bit. So thank you to all of our members. And we appreciate you joining us as our community continues to grow. I also want to thank Waldo the Lost. Waldo the Lost one. Thank you, Waldo. Very generous. Also inviting some more people. Cindy, Coco, Dark, August, and John Doodle, all now members, courtesy of our friend, Waldo the Lost. Thank you, Waldo. Thank you, Dolphin Fan. It's really cool. Our, our live streams that are member-only live streams are getting fuller and fuller every day, and people are making good connections, and we're having we're, we're able to go a little bit deeper, a little more casual than some of our conversations here. And so if you sound like you want to join a community, we have an amazing one and we invite you to come and join us. And so let's also say hello to the super chats that came in from our YouTube friends before we check in on Twitter and on the rumbles. Who is in the house today? We did have a couple. Thank you, everybody. We had this one come in from Carl. It's Carl sent one says next the proud boys will have to prove their water bottles warrant for waterboarding they're so screwed this judge has an opinion says carl borchers indeed indeed now yeah they, i feel like there are double standards throughout this entire jurisdiction throughout this entire inquisition is really the better way to phrase it but they have been getting basically bad ruling after bad ruling everywhere we look. And today we see that the judge is now opening the door to a whole line of cross-examination that is not going to be good. We'll, of course, be here. Thank you, Carl. Funny comment. Yeah, they're responsible for basically everything. Voice of the People is here. Good to see you, Voice. Says, I like Mr. Sweat's name. Fun fact, I went to a school with the guy named... Richard, last name Head. Richard Head. And if you know how you uh, uh, abbreviate the name Richard, then you know what that guy's name is. Right? Yeah. Sometimes Richard's is abbreviated Dick. So you can see how that works. Another one from Carl. Thank you, Carl. And thank you from Voice of the People. I actually went... I actually went to a uh, to school with a guy whose father's name was Richard Dick. Okay, Richard Dick was his last name, is his full name. So that's that's and his parents did that to him. Really funny guy, ton of fun. Carl Borcher says, "Why would the Proud Boys want to disrupt the, the GOP contestation of the Electoral College count vote?" That's what was happening. The Democrats and the FBI instigated the riots to disrupt this. In my opinion. I'm with you on that, Carl. I don't know if they affirmatively, actively instigated it and wanted it to happen, but they were at least negligent in preventing it from happening. They had informants all over the place. They rejected increased security around the Capitol. The sergeant at arms denied a request from Stephen Sund. We had the... National Guard that was suggested by Donald Trump declined. Interesting. Why was that? They knew they were either in on it or they were incompetent. Pick one. Tony Hay says that, thank you, Tony, says, thanks. The only one that covers the Proud Boys trial, they are, they are good people. Standing for the Constitution, the commies won't allow that. Make America great again. Yes, I think that they are trying to obliterate an entire side of a political conversation. And that there are many good people who are caught up in this. This has been extract, you know, this is not only about the Proud Boys, right? The Proud Boys are the J6ers. They are just the, sim the symbolic scapegoat for this thing. But Joe Biden came out and extrapolated from this to all extreme MAGA Republicans, right? It's like, half the country now. And there were many other 
insurrections at state capitol buildings and even other you know january uh, i'm sorry other washington insurrections that you could point to and cops in those insurrections weren't shooting people in the face on those and they didn't have 50 undercover plus informants embedded in those insurrections either and they're not spending billions of dollars and weaponizing the whole doj to take advantage of those Maybe they should, maybe they will. Maybe the pendulum will swing the other way. I don't think that's good law, but that is how the country is currently working. We see this one from Tony. Thank you, Tony. It says, I love to share this link with you. Loves butterflies on YouTube. She goes to the Arizona border for a few years now. She can show you the truth. I'll, I'll take a look. Loves butterflies on YouTube. All right, my friends. You heard the man, Tony Hay says check out love loves butterflies on youtube and i will take a look at that looks like she's also on facebook too good stuff all right thank you for sharing that i appreciate you there tony hey monkets and shout out to loves loves butterflies over on youtube we had some very nice friends saying hello on rumble who is in the house hey jentifer is over there we got a question from Jentifer. What's up, Jentifer? Says, can the defense let the jury know that the Proud Boys is infiltrated with more feds than civilians? Uh, no, no. They've they've signed a stipulation. I think uh, I think the stipulation was only to eight feds, but they can't talk about the other fed. I mean, they're not even disclosing this evidence. Okay, the other 50, forty plus feds from HSI and whatever other agencies. Those have not even officially been a part of this case yet. Honestly, the Proud Boys defense team is saying that this is a basis for a motion to dismiss because they have not been provided that. But as far as the government is concerned, as far as, as, far as the court is concerned, that's not actual evidence. It's not even in the case yet. It's not relevant. It's not supposed to be here. Uh, and so it hasn't been admit, admit, admitted. So the jurors don't know that. The jurors do know that there were a handful of other CHSs but not the extent. They're not seeing the same motions that we have seen. And the other part of your Jennifer's question, the whole group is infested with the FBI. The jury needs to know this. Great coverage, Rob. Thank you, Jennifer. I would agree. I would think that they would need to know that. That's my take on it. I'm a defense attorney and my whole, whole strategy would be that this is a this is a, 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 a an alleged conspiracy within a conspiracy and that there is no evidence that there was an actual conspiracy because they were communicating with feds out the wazoo and in all of those communications, there's no evidence of a common scheme or plan, but they can't talk about that. They can't bring in all of that material to show the jurors that Enrique's messages to confident to CHS one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, bring them all in here. All of you. Number one, did Enrique tell you he was going to take over the Capitol? No. Next one. You. No, next one. You, no, next one. You, no, times 50 of them. But the judge says, no, you can't do that. Okay, this is gonna, I'm in trouble now. Let's see what we have here. We had a super chat come in on Rumble from our friend Sada K. He says, just wondering if you figured out how to pronounce my name. Obviously I have. It's Sadake. It's Sadake is how you say it, obviously. Sadake is in the house. Good to see you, Sadake. How'd I do? How <laughs> I do, Sadake? Oh, gosh. Let's see how we did. Sadake, are you in the house? How we do? How do we do? We're going to wait to see. <laughs> I don't know if he's still there. We gave it a, our best shot. I'm not sure how we did. We'll keep, we'll keep working on it. You know how these things go. All right, let's see who else is over on the Twitterverse. Oh my goodness. Okay, we're back down to earth. We've come back down to uh, Rationalville. Back down to, you know, all right. But we've got three viewers here now, and one of them's me. So, all right, we're back here. We crossed 200 yesterday. That's, I don't know what happened. I, I think like the planets were aligned. There was something weird going on. And we got, you know, we broke into the triple digits, which has never happened before, so. If you were here for that, you saw probably a historic event. Glad that you made it. Here, Danny McWilliams is in the house. 
didn't we fight a war with the British over court cases like this? It was the war like 1776 or something like that. Yeah, I remember that. It was a kind of an important, important uh, era in our time. We're supposed to learn from that. Not sure we are now. A monkey says, doesn't the judge scold them daily? Actually, yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, it's not. It's I should just that's just my recurring headline. Judge scolds defense day 55. Judge scolds defense day 56. Ultra MAGA says, of course he did. Can't let a proper defense get in the way of a show trial. <laughs> here's a guy, Robert. Uh, here's a, here, it's almost like a poem. A guy from the industry says, Robert, the lawyer of the land. And sometimes he grows veggies from his head. Great channel for accurate news and court cases. I like that lawyer of the land. Maybe he grows veggies from his hand. I come up, I'll have to come up with something like that. Hey, Brandon says, hey, the morning streams are awesome. Even our federal buddies are invited if they can wrestle the funds away. Yeah, there's feds always in the chat. Or always, We always want to say hello to the feds in the chat. Shout out to the FBI. How are you guys doing over there? Hopefully you're going to have a nice, you know, evening tonight after nice dinner and bedtime, your bubble baths and your chicken nuggets, whatever you ha have over there. I hope you're having a great night too, enjoying the show. All right, my friends. I think that is about it for us on the day. Shout out to our Rumble friends. Good to see you, NC Native. Nick Danger's over there. Hey, Sadaki. Sadake is in the house. Let's see how we do here. Hmm. Says, nope, read down the chat. All right, I'm gonna have to go dig into the chat. It's going too fast for me here. A lot of colors. I'm all discombobulated. All right. So we will come back tomorrow, my friends. We are done for the day. Very grateful for you joining us as we go through this doozy of a trial. Don't forget to join us and become a member at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And if you join up, grab the Telegram group, because even though we're done here, we are going out to our, we are going out to our after party and our members only debrief for YouTube members and locals members. All right, here we go. We got a correction on the record. Sadaka. Sadaka is how I say it. Sadaka. Sadaka. I, I need to hear it, actually. Sadaka. Good to see you, Sadaka. And good to see you, Sue's Day and Dog Digger. And we have a job well done. Good to see you, too. NC Native. Good to see everybody over there. Also, so watching the watchers.locals.com, YouTube members, we'll see you tomorrow as well. Click the join button right on the YouTube screen. Don't forget to get your field of greens. It's important to be healthy. It's important to get your new nutrition. Get your daily servings of your fruits and vegetables with our friends over at fieldofgreens.com. They've got sleep stuff. They've got energy athletic stuff. They've got collagen stuff, all sorts of stuff. Fieldofgreens.com, code Robert when you check out. If you like the mind map and you want to use a mind map in your own projects, you can grab it, uh, make a free account, spotlightlawyer.com slash mind map. I use it for everything, including the show. I use it for notes, projects, all sorts of stuff. It really is a cool tool. It's pretty easy to use and I recommend it. Spotlightlawyer.com slash mind map. Thanks to the mods who mod down the fort for us. Our friend Vienti Kiss Prime, K Bean, Just Cause, Playing Hooky. Ronnie Cole, our friend Zulu, Geomancy, Zach Nichols, and John Allen. Grateful for all of your help keeping the show on track. Our meme smith, Sleepy Dogly, Gigum Gigum over on our locals. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. Members, we'll see you back here in the morning. We're going over to our debrief and our after party. Would love to see you there. But if not, we will be back here tomorrow to do this all Hey, wait a minute. We missed the super chat. How did I, how did I almost do that? Lance. Thanks, Lance. Gosh, what a, what a dip dip over here. Lance says, Ivory talked about the Chinese who was charged in LA for giving poll worker data to the CCP. He sued TTV. The nationals were in Wuhan. Coinky dink? Would love to see a deep dive on that. I'm not sure who this person is. Ivory. So I'm just going to copy and paste all of this. And then I'll take a look and see if I can dig up whatever that is.
is this this story? Election firm involving Eugene Yu. Is it this guy? Eugene Yu from the New York Times. And right, I got the story up. I'll read that as soon as we're done here. Thank you for that, Lance. Sounds like an interesting one. If that is a lawsuit that is ongoing, could be curious. I appreciate you sending that in. Thank you for the super chat. All right, my friends, that is it for us on the day. We are going to leave it there. Come in and join us at watchingthewatchers.locals.com where we will go to our after party. And we'll leave it there. If I don't see you, we'll see you right back here tomorrow so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Have a beautiful evening, my friends. Sleep very well. See you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody.